Thank you for joining us today for the NASP webinar on the myth of IQ, 100 years of misconception and impact on fair intellectual assessment, SLD determination and instructional planning. My name is Eric Rossen. I'm the NASP Director of Professional Development and Standards and I will be moderating today's webinar. So now I'm very excited to introduce our very esteemed presenter today. Dr. Jack Naglieri is research professor at the University of Virginia a senior research scientist at the Devereaux Center for Resilient Children. His expertise includes theoretical and psychometric issues about intelligence, cognitive processes, interventions, resilience, and executive function. And his publications include more than 300 scholarly papers, books, and tests. So with that, I will turn it over to Jack. Thank you, Eric. I want to extend my thanks to Eric and um, the other folks at NASP who made this possible today. It's a real pleasure to be here and um, share some ideas. Um, just as an interesting little footnote, I've, I've been a member of NASP since 1975 and um, spoken at uh, every one of the conferences since, except for one since 1978. So it's always a pleasure to um, be able to uh, share some ideas with my uh, school psychology colleagues. Um, you can get more information uh, about the articles and such that I'll be referring to today from my website. Um, there's a lot of information there, a lot of different types, but really everything I'm going to show you today, you can read the actual articles from my website. And of course, I'll be talking about some of these different instruments that I've um, or referenced, some of these different publications of mine. I like to start with the big picture first to help you understand like where we're going. So I think that what we do as school psychologists is so critically important to so many children. And especially when we do comprehensive assessment. I mean, think of all the children's lives you have changed as a result of the work that you do, trying to understand how they learn best, trying to understand what might be interfering with their ability to learn. So I take this really, really seriously because we do have tremendous impact on the people that we work with. And I would also suggest that what we're, what we're doing in terms of comprehensive assessment, especially cognitive assessment, in a lot of ways is outdated. And today I'm going to show you in a, in a short amount of time some of the strengths and limitations of traditional IQ and the tools that we have to understand them and interpret them. But here's the really good news. The good news is that we do have research that clearly shows that measuring basic psychological processes instead of traditional IQ is more socially just, it's more effective for identification of children who have a specific learning disability, and it provides instructional guidance in really very important ways. It also is not encumbered by knowledge, which I'll talk some more about. So this is the big picture for today. This article that I have on the screen is one that just came out um, a few weeks ago, you can also get that on my website. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the written version of what we're going to do uh, today. So this is the basic outline. We're going to talk about traditional IQ tests, strengths and weaknesses. We're going to talk about measuring basic psychological processes and the advantages of measuring cognitive processes. And we'll do that in the 50, 53 minutes that we have left. So. Let's think about why we have what we have. I mean, oftentimes when we say, oh, I'm using a new test, you know, the fifth edition of something, I, I chuckle because we know the history. The history is really very important. And I'm going to help you understand this through my own history. So my interest in intelligence and instruction really started out in my first profession as a professional musician. This is the first band I ever played in, 
And when I was only 17, I was teaching guitar. And I learned that some of my students really were able to learn well and do really well, and others didn't. And I really wanted to know why. When I went off to college, I really resonated towards psychology um, because really that helped me understand how not only people, but you know, through animal learning and other models, brain-based learning, helped me understand how people learn. That's what I'm all about. How do we understand how people learn and how do we know how to measure that? When I started working as a school psychologist, I worked in this school that's shown here, Champaign Elementary School in the mid seventies. And I noticed something really curious, but I never really grasped the importance of it until later. And that was when I gave my intelligence test, you know, a whisk, a whisk at that time, and even still today, I noticed that a lot of the questions on the WISC were just like the tests on the achievement test, the test items on the achievement test I was giving. And I thought it was weird. You know, like you'd have vocabulary on your IQ test and vocabulary on an achievement test. Or you'd have math, arithmetic, word problems on both, and so on. This doesn't really make sense. And I think that the similarity of intelligence and achievement tests today is really the biggest problem that we have in our field. We should not give intelligence tests that demand knowledge, especially to students who aren't doing well in school because they haven't, they've had some kind of learning disability because then their IQ scores look lower than they really are. So any kind of an achievement-based measure of intelligence is gonna be inappropriate for someone who hasn't had the opportunity to learn. This is really the fundamental social justice issue that my colleague and friend Tulio Otero and I have been writing about and speaking at at NASP, that this is really a social justice problem. And as I mentioned, it's especially problematic for students who have a learning disability. Think about it, you don't read much, you don't read much, you don't get a good vocabulary, and when you sit down and you get tested by the school psychologist, we give a vocabulary test and we say it's one of the best measures of G on this instrument. Well, it may be, but it's confounded by knowledge because an ability test should measure thinking, not knowing. An ability test should help you understand how a person thinks, how well they can think, not be confounded how much they know. So why do we have this problem? Just a little, little bit of history um, about this. You know, it, the, the, the traditional IQ test that we use today, WEF, so the Binet, even the Woodcock Cognitive, um, differential ability scales, they all really are closely related to the work of the US military in the early 1900s. People like Thorndike and Otis of Otis Lennon and others when they developed the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. In 1917, after developing and then testing these instruments, they determined that the tests were effective for aiding and segregating, uh, eliminating mentally incompetent and classifying men according to their mental ability. And so I really think of this 1917 as the birth date of the traditional IQ with verbal and quantitative nonverbal subtests. And now, of course, they're morphing into different kinds of scales, but basically it's the same, same thing. So, you know, what, what we had was an army alpha. So this was all the vocabulary kind of stuff. And sorry, I'm just going to try to move this out of the way. Um, and what we had was the army beta, which is, you could call it nonverbal, like um, amazed mazes or coding or object assembly. Now, take a look at whose book I made a copy of. Wexler was a military examiner. He gave the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. And really, Wexler had verbal and nonverbal portions of his test, right? But why did he have nonverbal, sorry, why did he have nonverbal 
tests, just like the military. Why do they have that? Because when people like this, Antonino Miranda, left southern Italy on this boat of the Cunard Line, he would have landed at Ellis Island, which in fact he did. And when he was there, they would have asked him questions. And I'm sure he would have said, no, Capito, he didn't understand. They would have put a little chalk mark uh, X on his lapel because of screening out for very low functioning individuals at that time. And I know they would have given him a test like this, which is object assembly, and how he would have solved it very readily. And they would have said to him, go to Little Italy where you belong, which is what he did. He lived in this building on 111 Mulberry Street. He was my grandfather. And my grandfather never went beyond eighth grade in, in Italy. And he didn't know a lot. But he was smart enough to have his own grocery store to be a successful businessman. That's why we had this alpha and beta, because as Joachim and Yorkies said in their book, men who fail in alpha, the verbal, are sent to beta in order that injustice by reason of unfamiliarity with English may be avoided. They saw the social justice issue 100 years ago. I was never taught this in the many years that I was taught cognitive assessment. We should have been. Now I'm gonna give you, I mean, it's not a Saturday Night Live up, uh, weekend update, but I'm gonna give you a little research update here to just give us a, a bit of perspective on things. Now, research on G. Of course, G is an important concept in our field. It's talked about quite a lot, G or general ability. Um, if you go back and you look at Wexler's definition, the aggregate or global capacity of the individual to act purposefully, to think rationally and deal effectively with this environment, aside from being, you know, not very um, politically correct, his, her would have been better. Um, you know, it, it's really getting at overall ability, not verbal and nonverbal abilities, plural which we so often talk about. And interestingly, in the uh, forward of the Wexler Nonverbal, of which I'm the author with, with uh, David Wexler, who was actually the best co-author I ever had because he never objected to anything I said because he was dead since the 80s and we published a lot of it long after that. But anyway, um, look at what Alec Alpin wrote about Wexler's view, the emphasis in the Wexler Nonverbal Manual on the full scale that measures general ability non-verbally and not non-verbal ability is a way in which what I proposed and what I did with the Wexler Nonverbal was so consistent with Wexler. Because Wexler remained a firm believer in Spearman's G theory. He believed that verbal and performance or non-verbal scales represented different ways to access G, but he never believed in nonverbal or verbal intelligence as being separate from G. This is really very important because of course, we are encouraged to go well beyond G. Now, there has been a series of research articles that if you don't know about, you should, uh, uh, you should learn about. Um, and they've been done by a number of people, some of which I've known, like Marley Watkins, who's one of the authors on this, um, this, uh, this article. I've known Marley since um, early 1980s and Gary Canavay, who I've known for a very long time. These are people that I know and I value their opinion. Um, they have done a line of research on all the traditional tests using a variety of different psychoanalytic methods. And what they found consistently is this small proportions of variance uniquely captured by the part scores, but support for the use of the scale, the total score. In other words, they're saying the total score has value but we can't find enough 
variance accounted for by the parts to say that they should be interpreted. Um, this recent paper um, also looked at this issue, especially as it relates to CHC, and they went back and reanalyzed John Carroll's work, and their results were the same. The results of the study indicate that most of the cognitive abilities, abilities specified in the three stratum theory have little to no interpretive relevance beyond that of G or general intelligence. That's a really strong statement. So it's what they're suggesting is focus the score interpretations on measures of general intelligence. And it's not just these two articles, it's a whole bunch of articles. So the implications are that the scales on traditional IQ tests are irrelevant. That puts us in a really tough spot because we really want to be able to measure more uh, than just G because we really want to understand why a student is failing. We need to know more than G. I mean, G, if you think about it, the whole ability achievement discrepancy thing for SLD, I mean, that failed because you're just comparing one big total score to academics. You never really found out what's wrong, but you can't get anything wrong because you require the the overall score to be in the average range. So we've been we've been hurting ourselves and they're hurting the kids. So we have to keep in mind that why we have this problem with traditional IQ tests is because they're based on 100-year-old concepts of what the content of tests should be. There, there is no theoretical conceptualization behind those tests. They weren't built on, the, on brain function. Um, and most importantly, they require too much knowledge. The knowledge piece is really very problematic. Now, the only, the only exception to this line of research, the only exception that has been reported in terms of all the different tests. So if, for example, these authors have looked at the WISC-4, the WISC-5, the WASTE-4, the Stanford Binet, the RIAS, the WASI, and on and on and on and on. But the only test that they found that had enough variance accounted for after G was cognitive assessment system, the test that I published. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. So just this is the literature. You can go read all this article, all these articles and get all this literature that's out there. I'm just presenting it to you so you know what's what. Now, let's think about this. Let's just kind of Let's kind of um, let's kind of let's just take a, a one more little step here. Some people have said to me that yes, tests like the Stanford Binet, WISC five, the WJ, the, even the, the parts of the KBC, they have tests that require knowledge, especially verbal tests, and they say that these tests have validity as measures of intelligence because they're so highly correlated with G. I don't accept that logic. And I especially don't accept the logic that we should have tests of intelligence that have knowledge in them. I think about our, the tests that we have on a continuum, like the Stanford Achievement Test, the KT, the Woodcock Achievement Test, um, these are tests that are designed to measure knowledge. Tests like Steve Pfeiffer's measures, good measures of knowledge. Steve goes a little further than that, though. If you can, if you read my work with Steve, you'll see how. When you get to the Woodcock Cognitive and the WISC um, and the KBC, if you're using, if you're not using the Luria model, then these are confounded by knowledge. It's not until you get to the nonverbal tests or like the CAS um, or like the unit, for example, Bruce Brackens and Steve McCallum's 
that you get tests that are going to measure thinking more than knowing. And just so, just as a point of reference here, because if you read Joe Matarazzo, I don't know, uh, I, I don't think Joe Matarazzo is as widely known as he was when I was uh, first learning cognitive assessment, but he and Wexler wrote a lot together. And he has a very famous book, um, Wexler's Adult Appraisal. And I, I know Joe, I've known him for a long time. He's, I have tremendous respect for him. And I've spoken to him about this. But if you read their book, Joe clearly says that a man's vocabulary is necessarily influenced by his educational and cultural opportunities. And when referring to the arithmetic subtests, its merits are diminished by the fact that it's influenced by education. So the impact of education on intelligence tests has been clearly known for a long time, but we ignore it. We ignore it all the time. I saw it as a new school psychologist, but I just did what we all do. I talked about verbal intelligence and nonverbal intelligence because that's what I was taught back then. But I don't do that anymore. Now, as I was saying, some people say that the subtests with verbal content are needed also because they correlate so well with achievement. And of course, this is a circular argument. If you have achievement in your intelligence test, you shouldn't be surprised that it correlates with your achievement test. Now, um, in my book that I published with Julio Otero, we present evidence that, in fact, if you compare the correlations between all the different traditional tests with achievement and the non-traditional tests, the CAS, with achievement, the, that using basic psychological processes actually correlates higher with achievement than these other instruments do. But recently, an important paper was published, and that's this paper by George Giorgio. This is a meta-analysis. They looked at all the research on the relationship between past theory and academic achievement, and what they concluded that, sorry, what they concluded was that the past theory predicted, correlated with achievement higher 